attendance list growing here. We'd love to hear where you're at over in the chat. And remember, when you get over to the chat down there at the bottom where you type, there's a little blue box. Make sure you flip that over so it says panelists and attendees so that we can all uh, take part in the chat together. I think it defaults to just being the panelists, which means only the four of us can see it. So you're going to want to make sure to flip that over so it says panelists and attendees. That way we can all see that. And he's here from Bellingham, Washington, right? Like literally halfway between Trisha and me. <laughs> That's great. Pasco. Can you see my slides? Yeah, looks good. Yeah. We want to okay. see full screen and we'll be good. Awesome. A couple from Woodby Island, a couple from Pasco, Yakima. Nice. Very cool. Okay, there we go. Uh, this is uh, this is awesome, Tricia. This is uh, two weeks in a row we've had things uh, specifically tied to literacy. Correct. That's right. Yes. Yeah, it's nice. It's a little... I sat in last week. She was awesome. Yeah. That's right. Yes, you were there last week. Yeah, she was really great. And if anybody is watching or listening to this, of course, all of our past webinars are also on the Reimagine website. Um, Chrissy seems to turn around almost in like 24 hours, Jeff. I yeah. don't know if that's, that's about Pretty right. close. So. Which you just reminded me, I haven't made the registration link for next week's yet. So I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> I can already tell that there's an email coming like, excuse me, where is the registration link for next week's webinar? <laughs> We almost just need a channel in our Slack, like with person's name in trouble so that you can just yeah. check out <laughs> Trisha in trouble, Jeff in trouble. Oh, it's only ever me. Let's be honest. I'm the only <laughs> other, I'm the only one that's ever in trouble. <laughs> oh, I'm so, I'm, I've been so looking forward to, to this conversation this afternoon and Lisa and Becca, I'm so glad that you were able to join us. Um, and for, for those of you who haven't heard their news, Correct me if I'm wrong, but it was this weekend that you were celebrating the first year anniversary of your nonprofit. Is that correct? Yes, November yeah. 6th is our one year anniversary. And you just achieved so much in that year, like been featured in USA Today within that year. I know that you just, you know, because I'm in Canada, shout out to Tegan and Sarah, who you can't be Canadian and not who they, who they are. You just won one of their grants, which is outstanding. I'm just, I'm absolutely mind mind blown by what you've been able to achieve in, in this year. So I'm just really looking forward to, to this session. So thank you. I know that you both have been so busy, but I really appreciate you giving up some of your time. Absolutely. Yeah. We're super excited about this. We're thrilled to be here. Um, are you ready for us to begin? Yes, let's do it. Let's yeah? do it. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, I keep on wanting to say good evening, but it's good afternoon. I'm out in New Jersey and it's nighttime here, but good afternoon for all of you who are on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Lisa Foreman and I'm the founder of Pride and Less Prejudice. Um, I use the pronouns she and her. Um, just a little bit about me. I um, got my bachelor's degree many moons ago from Boston University in both music and psychology. And then I continued on to get a master's in music therapy from New York University. And I did music therapy therapy for many years. Um, and I have my two kids and I started to do other work. And I became a music educator, preschool teacher uh, and a piano teacher for the last 25 years. So I've worked with little kids for a very long time. Um, and my daughter, Rebecca is gonna co-present with me tonight. Awesome. Um, so I'm Becca. I'm not sure if people can see me, but I am here controlling uh, the screen in the background. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently calling in from Washington, D.C. I graduated from Smith College three years ago um, with a bachelor's degree in women and gender studies and an archives concentration. Um, I moved to D.C. to do 
um, LGBTQ and reproductive rights opposition research at Media Matters for America. Um, and now I'm at a public interest law firm. I've been there for about two and a half years. Um, and for the last year, I've been the outreach coordinator for Pride and Less Prejudice. And I also um, am a contributing writer with TAG Magazine, which is uh, an LGBTQ uh, women's outlet here in the States. We are uh, one of two queer women's print magazines currently left in circulation. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited to be able to uh, present to you guys today. So yeah, uh, we're also just really thankful for everybody taking the time out of their busy lives to join us because I know lots of people have things going on. Um, we are going to do our presentation called Read Out Loud, Read Out Proud, LGBTQ mm -hmm. Acceptance in Schools. Um, the first half of our presentation today is going to be about Pride and Less Prejudice. Um, it's going to be about our organization, what we do, who we are, why we do it. And then the second half of the presentation is going to be more about um, why an inclusive classroom is important. So just a little bit about Pride and Less Prejudice. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that provides age appropriate LGBTQ books for classrooms pre-K to third grade. Um, and so the mission of Pride and Less Prejudice is to promote positive LGBTQ representation by providing LGBTQ inclusive books to classrooms from pre-K to third grade. And we believe that such representation will not only normalize LGBTQ identities in classrooms, but it will also foster the support of LGBTQ and questioning youth themselves, making them feel more at home in educational spaces. Additionally, it will benefit other children by introducing them to perspectives different from their own. This will result in more empathetic classrooms and compassionate communities for all. So just a little bit about the basics of how we work. Basically, we have people who donate money and we take that money and we provide the free books to teachers at no cost. Um, to this point, all of our dollars have gone directly to the books. Um, we've been able to keep that for the entire year. True, I, we just paid our own startup costs and all the money that's been donated has gone directly to the books. Um, so we are also um, applying for grants uh, from foundations and corporations to see if we can continue to support the demand for the books because we're <laughs> really getting a lot more demand than we thought we would. Um, but we can donate the money in honor of somebody or in memory of somebody or just to, to donate books. Yeah, I would say pr predominantly we are We've been funded through individual donations, but um, as Trisha mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we uh, just received a $2,000 grant from the Deegan and Sarah Foundation um, to focus our work specifically in Canada. But um, the rest of the money that we've raised so far has been through individual donations and some publisher donations to uh, this round, which was really exciting. So we have a really diverse set of books. Um, we started a year ago, we had 14 other books. And in this past August, we launched 16 new books. Uh, thrilled to see that there are so many titles out there that we had trouble actually choosing which ones. Um, but here are some of the ones that we have this year. Um, if you click the next slide, Becca, we can show you that we have some that are on LGBTQ history. This day in June is about history and culture. Um, Stonewall, a building and uprising revolution is more about the history of Stonewall. Um, both really great history books. Then we have books like that families that might look different than your own. Um, the two on the top, the adventures of Honey and Leon and a plan for pups. Um, they're just two books that happen to have two dads or two grandpas. It's not the central storyline at all um, that it's LGBTQ themed. It just happens to be the two dads have two dogs, they go on an adventure, uh, the two grandpas have um, a grandchild and it's about the relationship between the grandchild and their two grandpas. It's a really great story and it's just, you know, a book uh, about normalization. Um, we also have My Footprints, which is a book of Vietnamese American child who has two moms. And then we have Antonio's Card, which is a wonderful bilingual book, both in English and in Spanish. And that character also has two moms and it's uh, around Mother's Day and making a card on Mother's Day and, and uh, what happens in school when you have two moms and you're trying to make a Mother's Day card because <laughs> everybody else seems to have a mom and a dad. 
Then we have books like uh, the topic is more pride in yourself, not quite narwhal. <laughs> it's a wonderful story about a narwhal who uh, lives with narwhals and eventually finds unicorns <laughs> and just tries to decide whether they need to be a narwhal or a unicorn or can they be both. Um, it's a really sweet story. And Jerome by Heart is about a little boy who has a great affection for another little boy. Um, and then what does a princess really look like is more about gender, gender stereotypes. Um, and that's a great book as well. Uh, another category that we have is about gender identity. And here are some examples. We have Jack, not Jackie. That's uh, more about change and acceptance. It's a story about a, trans a transgender child. Um, Sparkle Boy, it's about change, respect, and freedom. It's also a really nice story. When Aiden became a brother, um, becoming an older sibling, it, it's also a transgender story. And it's about becoming an older sibling and about many different types of transitions you can have in your life. And the last one is Introducing Teddy, which says right in the title, a gentle story about gender and friendship. And that's really what it is. Um, other things that we supply in terms of support besides just sending the books to teachers, pre-K to third grade classrooms, is on our website, we have resource guides. Um, we had 14 books last year, we have 16 books this year. So all 30 books, there are teacher resource guides up on our website um, and they look like this. It'll have the title on the top, tells you the authors, the illustrator, the grade level that the book is appropriate for, a description of the story, and then some conversation starters. This one is about the book, I Am Jazz. The story follows Jazz Jennings, a transgender girl who has always loved soccer, swimming, the color pink, and most of all, mermaids. Jazz's family didn't always know she was a girl, and that was frustrating and difficult. Now that Jazz is able to be who she is, she feels happy and proud. And so some of the questions are, how do you think Jazz feels when her family doesn't understand her? Or how, does you, how do you think Jazz feels when her family finally sees her for who she really is? And Jazz is proud to be different because it makes her feel special. What makes you feel special? So these are great conversation starters after reading or sharing a book like this with the classroom. And then it also gives you a little um, tab at the bottom that says, why include this in your library? If you're thinking about picking new books and looking for inclusive stories, here's some reasons why this one is good. So um, they're free and they're up on our website under our resources. The other thing that we've been doing is we have started doing quarterly workshops, teacher workshops like professional development opportunities. And um, we just had our first one in October and it was combating prejudice perpetuated by normativity, creating an inclusive classroom environment. And it was presented by Mia Ibrahim. She is um, a queer Lebanese high school teacher. She's a music teacher. And she did a wonderful interactive workshop for us. Um, and the next one that's coming up, we don't have a picture of, but on January 26th um, at eight o'clock at night, we have author Rob Sanders, who's the author of that Stonewall book we were just talking about. He's gonna be doing a presentation called Telling Our Stories One Book at a Time. And it's gonna be an interview with, um, with Rob Sanders that evening. So every three months we're gonna try and do a different teacher support workshop. Um, and we're definitely looking for feedback to find out what teachers are looking for. So if you have any uh, suggestions, let us know. Um, and so, yeah, um, just wanna talk a little bit about what we've been doing for the last year. So we started Pride and Less Prejudice last November. And so far we've raised more than $9,500, which is very exciting. Um, and this includes, uh, as I mentioned earlier before, a recent $2,000 grant from the Tegan and Sarah Foundation to focus on uh, donations in Canada. And we also um, received book donations that totaled to about $1,100, um, which was also very exciting. Um, so since last November, we have donated more than 487 books to schools in the United States and Canada. Um, and once we uh, fill every request that we've had that's um, on the waiting list, we will have sent books to 39 states and several Canadian provinces. Um, 
In late August, we also created a hashtag read out proud celebrity campaign video, which we'll show you um, later on in the presentation. Um, but this was a video with LGBTQ celebrities like Adam Rippon and Nicole Maines talking about what Pride and Less Prejudice is and why our mission is important. Um, and we were really lucky that that led to um, media coverage in GLAAD, Human Rights Campaign, The Advocate, Broadway World, USA Today, and Tag Magazine. Um, we've also been featured on the Be A Better Ally podcast, which is Trisha's podcast. And if you haven't heard it, you should definitely listen to it because it's great. Um, and we also did a presentation for international students, uh, international high school students in Angola um, back in September, and we're excited to be, you know, connecting with teachers here that, um, you know, teach all sorts of different grades, and we'll have advice to give for for a variety of of, of uh, grades. And I'm going to give a shout out to Shay, who I just saw in the chat was clapping her hands because she is the coordinator of that program, and it's a fantastic, fantastic program. Um, the next part of this is talking about why did we create Pride and Less Prejudice? Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and, and how this got started. So there's a picture of myself and my husband and my two daughters, Rebecca, who's queer and my and who is 25, and my younger daughter, Allie, who we joke because her name is A-L-L-Y, and we say she was born an ally. So we're a very very supportive family and always have been very close knit. Um, and I look back at when my kids were growing up and I realized now, as I look back, that there was not a whole lot of uh, representation in books or media of any kind, TV, films. And I realized that once Rebecca started to see the representation on TV, and this is a picture of two of her shows that she loved as a teenager, Glee and Pretty Little Liars. When she started to see the relationship between Santana and Brittany on Glee and Emily and Paige on Pretty Little Liars, something definitely was speaking to her. And that representation was something that she had been searching for. And so I realized that if it had been missing for her, it must have been missing for a lot of kids. And, you know, it's not that different. Becca's 25, it isn't that long ago. Um, so I also started to think about what kind of books did I have in my own house? And what was I thinking was important for representation within my own family? So these are three that really stood out in my mind that um, I made sure that I had the story, tell me again about the night I was born because my sister had adopted two children and I really wanted that to be normalized in my house. So I made sure that I had that book in the house. And then the next book is Light the Lights. And it's a story about celebrating both Hanukkah and Christmas. Um, we come from an interfaith family. I'm Jewish and my husband is Italian Catholic. And I wanted my kids to think this also was normal. So to normalize that, I made sure I had that representation in my house. And where do balloons go and uplifting mystery? Um, we unfortunately had some people die that were close to us when my kids were young. And I felt like I wanted some books that um, were good explanations of death and dying. And so these were books that I thought my kids were never gonna see in their preschool class or in elementary school. And I needed to make sure this representation was there for me. I never would have guessed that I needed other representation, but that's the whole thing. When your kids are little, you don't know what kind of representation you need. So you need to have all of it. You need to have a diverse library in your home and in your school. Um, other books that I remember when my kids were little, Flat Stanley, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, Charlotte's Web. I'm sure those books are still used today. I think that we could use some more diversity in our classrooms. Yeah, um, and again, just to talk a little bit about some of the books I grew up reading. I was a very avid reader when I was little and still am. Um, but these are some of the books that I uh, read in my middle school English classes. And if people want to use the chat to share books that they either remember reading during middle school or books that they use um, in their middle school curriculum, I'd love to love to hear about that. Um, so Flowers for Algernon, The Giver, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Belle Teal, Heroes of Mice and Men. That was my middle school English curriculum. And well, um, those were all really great books. There was not any kind of um, LGBTQ or diverse representation in those books. I do 
I do remember in sixth or seventh grade reading Belle Teal and really connecting um, with the main character because she talked so much about how she thought her uh, teacher was pretty and I was very into my uh, sixth and seventh grade English teacher that I had for, for two years. And so um, it would have been so nice if that was you know an LGBTQ storyline and it would have made me feel that I wasn't alone or even you know maybe would have keyed me into the fact that I was queer earlier on. Um, and so I think that there's real um, advantages to having diverse um, and LGBTQ inclusive libraries, especially in middle school. Um, and then this is just a little bit about my high school English curriculum. Um, again, if people want to share some books that they remember reading in high school or are currently teaching in high school, um, I believe uh, all of these are from my English curriculum other than Animal Farm, which I think we actually read in social studies. Um, but we read um, Lord of the Flies, we read a few Shakespeare plays, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Hamlet and Macbeth. Then also The Great Gatsby was a summer reading one, one, uh, one year. The Stranger, The Metamorphosis, Catcher in the Rye, uh, Animal Farm, and Frankenstein. Um, and while these were all very interesting books, again, none of them really had LGBTQ inclusive storylines. Um, and so it would have been great if that was something that I was, um, that I was able to read in high school. Um, I do want to give some credit to my high school because I do think that there are some uh, books that they had that were diverse, even if they weren't LGBTQ inclusive. Um, so Song of Solomon is one that I remember. I was joking with my mom yesterday while we were practicing this presentation that I remember reading uh, Song of Solomon by Candlelight because we had lost power for Hurricane Sandy. And I think that was it must have been 2012 and our power went out and so I was like I have to finish this book I don't care if we don't have any power I'm gonna put on a candle um so love Toni Morrison wish that uh we had read more LGBTQ inclusive literature in high school but that that was a great one um also Maya Angelou I know why the cage bird sings uh, we also read To Kill a Mockingbird in freshman year and then um Ellie Wiesel's Night which is a memoir about the holocaust was one that was really powerful that we also read when I was in high school so going back to the fact that there was a lot of representation that was missing, um, thinking that that was Becca's experience and likely the experience of many other students currently, um, this is only five states right now that require public schools to teach LGBTQ history. It started with California, I believe in 2011, um, and then Illinois, New Jersey, Colorado, Oregon, they all followed more like 2018, 19, and now Maryland plans to do the same. Um, and I, I'm not really up on the status of all of it right now, but I know that there is pushback, even though this, the, the states are requiring it, they're really kind of dragging their feet um, and it's taking time to implement, um, but it's a change. At least we have some states that are requiring the public schools to teach the LGBTQ history. Um, but there also are states, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, South Carolina, and Texas that have the no promo homo laws. Um, and this is so upsetting for me to learn. And this is something I didn't know until I think um, you were working at Media Matters and you started to tell me about your job and that there are local or state education laws that expressly forbid teachers of sex ed and health classes from discussing LGBTQ people or topics in any type of positive light, if at all. Um, and some laws even require that teachers actively portray LGBTQ people in a negative or in an accurate way. Um, not only do the laws prevent LGBTQ people from learning critical information about their health, they also um, serve to further stigmatize the LGBT community by providing misleading information. So again, why we're doing Pride and Less Prejudice at such a young age, we're trying to promote LGBTQ representation in the classroom. We're trying to make the classrooms inclusive, foster acceptance and normalize the identities and create empathy. Um, this is true at any age, but if we start with the really young kids, it, it would be great to normalize it from the very, very beginning of education. Um, and I just wanted to also say about um, the LGBTQ history curriculums that the states are requiring. A number of leading professional organizations support those inclusive curriculums. 
um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Association of Social Administrators, American School Health Association, and the National Association of Social Workers are all organizations that support that. Um, and, and the more we do this work, maybe the more support we'll get. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just a little bit on, on the last point about um, normalizing LGBTQ identities, uh, we know that about uh, two in 20 kids in a given classroom are uh, somewhere on the LGBTQ uh, spectrum. And so we're doing this obviously for those two kids, but we're also, you know, doing this for the other 18 kids. So they are um, aware of LGBTQ people and their identities. And it's something that they will learn in the classroom and sort of carry on with them as they interact with LGBTQ people and people who are different from them in other ways um, for the rest of their lives. And so that's that's just a piece of our mission. That's That's also really important. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about um, the importance of an inclusive classroom. Um, these are some statistics from GLSEN, which is an organization that was founded by a group of teachers in 1990 that advocates for LGBTQ students um, in schools. And so this, these statistics are from their 2019 National School Climate Survey, which was released just a few weeks ago. Um, and so some of these st statistics were really surprising to me um, because you know, it seems as though things are getting better in terms of the LGBTQ um, climate, you know, even especially in schools. My sister's um, three years younger than me, and I know that even, you know, those three years made a difference. There were a lot more um, out LGBTQ students in high school, like after I graduated, um, than when we were both like in school at the same time. And so, um, but even still, there's still a lot of stigma, um, which, you know, it, I think it depends also on like different areas of the country can have um, different experiences and things like that. Um, and so according to these statistics, 86% of LGBTQ students have been harassed or assaulted at school, which is just like crazy. Um, and speaking specifically about transgender students, 84% of trans students have felt unsafe at school because of their gender. Um, I think a lot of this has to do with um, the bathroom policies that schools have. I did a lot of research on the anti-trans um, bathroom policies when I was at Media Matters, and that's something that um, you know contributes to trans people feeling uncomfortable at school. Um, and so this is really important, and this creates sort of an education gap between LGBTQ students and and their peers, where LGBTQ students um, are missing school more often. They have lower GPAs and they have lower self esteem. Um, so it definitely has has a big impact on overall um, education uh, attainment and things like that. Um, and so we. Um, are working to try and get an LGBTQ in class inclusive classroom be initiated in lots of different schools because that's just one way that LGBTQ plus students um, will feel safer and more supported. Um, but we also know that that's not the whole picture. Um, we also need teachers and school staff who are supportive of LGBTQ students, which I think goes hand in hand with the curriculum. And we're so happy that you guys are here um, learning about this. It's really great to have teachers who are supportive and want to learn so that they can um, you know, create more inclusive classrooms. Um, you know, schools also need comprehensive anti-bullying and anti-discrimination policies. Some of that um, is related to the trans bathroom issue. Um, some of it is just general anti-bullying policies. Um, and we also have a lot of schools um, with gender and sexuality alliances. Um, those used to be called uh, gay straight alliances, GSAs when I was in high school, but they, the name has been expanded uh, to be a bit more inclusive. And so all of these things are things that um, we believe and GLSEN believes will um, help LGBTQ students feel um, safer and more supported in their classrooms. Um, this is also really interesting to statistic um, that that I found a couple of years ago when I was uh, working at a think tank actually um, that students who learn about LGBT issues in the curriculum report less harassment and this is true um, as you'll see with these statistics for all students and for LGBTQ students and so this sort of goes to show you that having a diverse inclusive curriculum is is really um, a good thing for for all kinds of students. Um, and, you know, this is something that we believe is true, whether or not school is happening in person or school is happening virtually. Um, we've still continued to ship books 
um, during the pandemic, you know, shipping to teachers personal addresses instead of to their schools if they're teaching from home. Um, and we know that home is sometimes not always the safest place to be for LGBTQ students. And that's part of the reason why we feel that it's important for these teachers to have these books and share share these resources and books even during the pandemic you know reading reading lgbtq inclusive books over zoom and things like that because you know sometimes students are home and that's not the safest place for them so going back a little bit about why we chose um, to start at pre-k through third grade um, just again, that elementary school ages is where kids learn how the world works, especially when they're really little. I've worked in preschools for such a long time with little kids, and we all know that our, our own kids or our kids that age are like little sponges. They just pick up all the information and they, real, you know, they realize um, uh, what's normal. The normalization begins at that age, right? If, you know, prejudice is definitely a learned behavior. Um, and they say that by age 12, it becomes concrete how kids um, see people who are different than themselves. And kids are going to see LGBTQ people in their lives. So we want to normalize that. So when they do come across a teacher who comes out or a person in the news or their grandfather or whoever, that it's just fine. It's just normal because they read a plan for pups or they heard of the adventures of Honey and Leon. And that was normal. It was just another story. Um, you know, as far as our experience has been, you know, 98% of the feedback that we've gotten so far has been positive, which has been incredible. But we have to remember that we're sending our books to people who are wanting them. They're asking for them. Um, you know, every once in a while, we do get some pushback from people, whether it be in our family or a friend that is not really educated enough to understand or just has different views. Um, I think that's the little bit of pushback that we've seen more than in the classrooms because we're we're sending them to people who are asking for them. Um, but common misconceptions include that you know people say, oh, the kids are too young, those conversations are better had at home. Uh, it's simply inappropriate. Um, and a lot of times people think LGBTQ themes, equal sex. And you look back at the, the books that I showed you, there's nothing to do with sex or having sex. <laughs> that, that's not what the books are about. You know, like I said, there's stories about somebody who has two moms and when, how, what do they do on Mother's Day when they're writing a card to their mom? Everybody's writing one card. Can that little kid write two cards? Could they have two moms? They're really simple stories. We need to educate not just the kids, but the teachers and the parents and the administrations and and everybody together. Um, but for us so far, you know, we've had good feedback and we're going to continue to send books to places where people are supportive and, and comfortable. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the hashtag read out proud celebrity campaign video that we did. Um, We've seen that social media has been uh, really wonderful to us in the past year since we've started and that's really helped us get the word out. Um, I worked with an LGBTQ activist about five or so years ago, um, Kristen Russo, who wrote a book for parents of gay kids um, and she went on a book tour and um, that was a really cool experience to help her plan her book tour. I interned for her. Um, and so when we started Pride and Less Prejudice, I reached out to her and said, hey, I know you have a big following on Twitter. Would you mind sharing our story and um, telling people about the resources that we provide. And so that was really wonderful to get her support. And um, I also reached out to GLAAD, the LGBTQ media advocacy organization, because I had interned there. And so then um, as we were getting uh, donations and requests, I started to think about other connections I had or other ways that we could spread the word. And so um, over the summer, we came up with the idea to do the celebrity campaign video um, and have different celebrities talk about the importance of LGBTQ inclusive literature in their classrooms. Um, we ended up getting really great coverage in places like The Advocate um, and Human Rights Campaign. And so um, we're gonna show you the video because we're really proud of it. Um, and again, it's uh, LGBTQ identified celebrities that we reached out to. I think I reached out to 
you know, more than a hundred uh, celebrities. Um, and then we ended up with, I think 13 or 14. And uh, we were really lucky and really pleased with the, with the responses. And so, um, yeah, we've got um, Daryl Stevens, who was in Noah's Ark. We've got Nicole Maines, who's um, a transgender actress who was cast as the first trans superhero on the TV show, Supergirl. Um, Adam Rippon, who is an ice skater. Um, Theo Germain, who was on Work in Progress and The Politician. Um, Tig Notaro and her wife, um, Stephanie Aileen, who was on uh, the new season of The L Word um, and a bunch of other um, really cool celebrities. So I am going to um, show you. Pride and Less Prejudice is a nonprofit organization that fosters LGBTQ plus acceptance by donating free age appropriate LGBTQ books to classrooms from pre-K through third grade. When children see people like themselves in books, they get a glimpse of who they might become and they feel validated. When children see books with LGBTQ characters and themes in their classrooms, it creates a more inclusive school culture. When we create an environment where all students know that being LGBTQ is not out of the ordinary, we create acceptance. When classrooms show an understanding that all families are unique and share many common values, beliefs, and traditions, we can help create community. LGBTQ plus representation is important to me because when I was growing up, I really didn't see a lot of it. LGBTQ representation is important, especially for young people, because it shows them that they are not alone. Seeing characters whose experiences reflect our own affirms that our feelings are valid and that we too deserve to be loved. I think that art and literature and music are windows into experiences and it's the fastest way to uh, shift ourselves towards better understanding of one another. Having LGBTQ books in my elementary school classroom, whew, that would have been amazing. I didn't really have any LGBTQ books in my classrooms growing up and I had to find them elsewhere and they were so affirming. If I would have had books with LGBTQ characters or themes in classrooms while I was growing up, I think maybe I would have felt a little bit at home. Oops. Would have made my childhood a lot better. I would have felt much less bizarre and much less weird. I would have felt just like part of, you know, part of a rainbow, of like other kids. It probably would have saved me uh, quite a bit of confusion uh over my sexual identity it just sort of showed me that you know i'm not crazy and that i'm not alone and that i'm not the weird one and i think also it would have opened the eyes of a lot of my classmates it really is important to have lgbtq characters you know represented especially with younger kids and while their minds are being shaped and to tell them that it's okay and we live in a world with different people and their stories are just as valid and important. So if I had seen that, it would have been normalized uh, much earlier in my life. Who knows? Who knows when I would have been able to recognize that part of my identity. It would have been really special. I hope that for other kids. Read out loud, read out proud. Please donate to Pride and Less Prejudice today. No donation is too small and every dollar counts. Help our teachers become better allies. Donate today. Read out loud. Read out proud. Open your heart. So that's our video. Thanks for watching. <laughs> um, it was a summer uh, labor of love trying to put that together between reaching out to all the celebrities and then, um, which Becca did, and then my other daughter, who's a film student, put that together for us. Um, and we never thought we would ever get such a great response. We thought, oh, if we get one or two celebrities, if that, that would be great. We'd have a spokesperson, that would be amazing. So we were really lucky, um, but, a little bit about that. So two things. One, I want to say that it goes hand in hand. Um, 
that we are looking for money. Pride and Less Prejudice is always looking for donations and support because in order for us to ship out the books, we need that monetary piece. And the reason why we made the video over the summer is because we had such a long waiting list. We started to panic and say, oh my God, this is really taking off and people really want the books and this is awesome, but we need to find a way to um, support it. So we were lucky that that really helped us get a lot of media coverage as well. Um, so the middle quote that you're looking at was one that Natasha said in the video, and it said, I think that art and literature and music are windows into experiences, and it's the fastest way to shift ourselves towards a better understanding of one another. And I feel like we need to have these books in the classrooms to have those windows and those mirrors for people to see that representation and for kids to see themselves and to normalize it for the other kids as well. It's a way to open up conversation. Um, you want to show that everybody belongs and everybody is worthy of being represented and not just during Pride Month or LGBTQ History Month. These books can be in classroom always. Um, a few things about representation in your classroom, you know, even from the littlest kids, you can put these books out on your shelf and try and integrate them with the other books so students can check them out as they wish. Um, you can recommend these books to particular students, or to all the students. You can pair reading groups or make book clubs and make these books a subject that they're talking about. Um, you can read the books out loud or highlight them in your teaching all year round. Like I said, it doesn't just have to be in Pride Month or an LGBTQ History Month. Um, we also want to involve the students, even the youngest students, to be included in choosing what books are in the classroom and to ask, you know, what kind of books do you want to see? What kind of representation do you want? What kind of a story do you want to hear? Maybe they'll say they want LGBTQ characters. Maybe they'll say powerful women or people with disabilities or immigrants or people of color. I mean, the list could go on and on and on. The important point is that you're asking from even a young age, what is it that you want to have in our library and help them be part of that? Yeah, um, so now we're going to transition a little bit towards more um, tips about how to make your classroom more inclusive. And even though we um, primarily target teachers from pre-K to third grade, I think that um, all of the tips that we're about to share sort of will apply to teachers of any grade. And um, we're excited to, to hear your feedback and there'll be a, a chance for Q&A at the end of our presentation. Um, so something that I think would is really important is for teachers to make the space reflective of your intentions. And so having um, signs that say safe space or posters of Harvey Milk, who was an openly gay um, mayor in San Francisco is, is a way to signal to your students that, um, you know, you are an accepting person and your classroom is inclusive. I remember in 10th grade US history class, I went in on the first day of school and my history teacher had posters everywhere in her room of sort of all really significant um, parts of history and significant events. And um, she went around the classroom on the first day and went to every poster in her room and explained the historical significance of the poster. Um, and on the second day of school, we actually had a pop quiz, which I thought was uh, pretty creative. Um, and none of the posters in her classroom were LGBTQ inclusive. And I and she was an LGBTQ inclusive teacher. I found this out later because um, I ended up coming out to her several years after I graduated, um, you know, and, and she was saying how supportive she was, but, you know, it was something that I didn't really know from the get go because there weren't, you know, posters in her classroom or even, you know, a lesson on LGBTQ history sort of any time um, within that year. And so I think that's something that teachers can do, you know, who teach any grade and very easily just put posters in their classroom and it, it makes teachers, it makes students realize that, hey, this is a safe person for me to talk to. And I think that making um, your space inclusive could even be if you're teaching virtually, you could have posters behind you in your room, you could have flags hanging, you know, it's not just a physical space, you can make your space even virtually be inclusive. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, something else that's really important um, for making transgender and non-binary students feel safe in the classroom is to make sure that you make pronouns a part of your class. Um, and what we have linked here, and we'll send some of these resources to you after the presentation, is lesson plans on pronouns from um, the Human Rights Campaign's Welcoming Schools project. Um, and so the basic idea here is to model how to share preferred gender pronouns um, you know, to the students, explain what your pronouns are, how they work, and why we ask for them, and then ask um, students for their own pronouns. Um, something that's really important for teachers to highlight is that pronouns can change and kids are allowed to approach teachers at any time of the year if their pronouns change. Um, and another really important thing is that um, teachers shouldn't assume that their students want the same pronouns at home and at school. Um, again, there's a lot of times where home might not be the safest environment. And so it's always important to talk to your students and make sure you know what pronouns they're using at home so you're not um, outing them in any way during any communication with the parents or a parent teacher conference. Um, and one other thing I'd like to add is that um, I think pronouns are becoming uh, sort of more generally accepted um, in society at a younger age. The first time I had heard about um, the idea of introducing oneself with pronouns was 2013 when I was visiting Smith College um, and was uh, meeting with students who lived in a particular dorm and we all went around and introduced ourselves by our pronouns and our names. Um, but I was talking to my boss uh, recently and her son is seven and he is in second grade, he skipped a grade. Um, and on the first day of school, they all virtually um, introduced themselves with their name and their pronouns. So I'm really excited that that's something that's getting recognized from a younger age. And again, it's just really important to do this so that way um, transgender and non-binary students can feel um, more safe and secure in, in the classroom. And you know, this is important to do even if you don't know that you have a trans or non-binary student in the classroom. It's something that will just make it easier for tr trans and non-binary students in general. And again, we'll, we'll carry with these other students for the rest of their lives so that way they understand the community. Um, a couple of other general uh, tips on being inclusive. Um, again, it's really important to try to avoid uh, gendered language if, if one can, like boys and girls, because um, there are people who don't fall into that category who might be um, non-binary or gender queer. And so um, I have a friend who's non-binary and uh, is my age and is always excited when when people don't use gendered language, um, you know, in introductions and things like that. Um, and this person was actually also a teacher. Um, and so they were always trying to avoid gendered language because, you know, they didn't use gendered language for themselves. Um, and so I think that's something that's really important and also easy to do um, starting at a young age. Um, another thing that I remember from elementary school is that a lot of times um, teachers would sometimes classify students by gender, like, okay, boys on one side, girls on the other. Um, and so that's, again, something that would be great to avoid to make transgender and non-binary students feel um, more comfortable. And so suggestions were to sort of organize your students by birth month, where you say everybody who was born from January to, to June on this side, everybody was born from, born from uh, July to December on that side, or you could even um, split people's up by the initials of their first or last names. Um, another thing that's really important to mention is um, you're gonna, you wanna try to avoid making it the responsibility of LGBTQ students to explain LGBTQ characters or, or issues. It's not, it's not their responsibility to educate the classroom much, much like it's not the responsibility of people of color to explain how racism works. And so you just sort of wanna be cognizant of of LGBTQ students and not putting too much um, on them in these situations. And also a lot of times I think like, you might know that a student is LGBTQ, but the rest of the classroom might not know. And so you always wanna like um, be cognizant of confidentiality and things like that. Um, and lastly, um, it's really important to call out bigotry when you hear it. I remember being in middle school and high school and people saying, oh, that's so gay. And like, we're using gay as a synonym for stupid. And so it's really important that if teachers hear bigotry like that, they call it out. So, you know, it stops the bigotry and, and tells those people that, hey, that's wrong, that's offensive, um, and make sure that those students 
you know, don't continue, but also shows that you are a supportive and inclusive teacher. And so, you know, that gay kid who maybe heard someone say that's gay and heard you stand up will say, hey, oh, my teacher is actually really supportive. This is someone that I could potentially go to if I want to talk about my sexuality or, you know, my family structure or things like that. Um, another thing that teachers can do is start a gender and sexuality alliance. I think I mentioned before these used to be called gay straight alliances, but um, the name has expanded to become more inclusive. Um, and so GSA Network is a great resource um, for teachers if you're interested in starting a GSA uh, at your school. Uh, the GSAs are typically created and run by students, but they always need supportive teachers to advise them. Um, we had a GSA in my high school. I ended up not joining because I was nervous that people would know that I was gay. Um, but I know other students who went to the GSA at my school and found it really helpful and really supportive. Um, and I wish that, you know, that there had been a GSA in middle school, because as I mentioned before, when I was in middle school, that was the, the time where I was sort of trying to figure out my sexuality and understand what certain things meant and why I felt certain ways. And, um, you know, middle school is sort of the time where gay and lesbian students and transgender students sort of realize that they might be, you know, attracted to another person of the same gender or might not identify with the gender that they were born with. And so it's really important to have GSAs um, in the middle school um, years as well, because that's when so much of that learning is, is taking place. Um, another uh, great suggestion is to ask the uh, school library to start a special section for culturally inclusive books. Um, I was a big reader and, you know, would have loved to have LGBTQ inclusive books in my, in my middle school classrooms, even uh, my middle school libraries, even if I didn't know that I was LGBTQ at the time, um, it would have been really great for me. And um, also would be great to suggest that English and history teachers institute an LGBTQ inclusive curriculum um, talking about LGBTQ history or having LGBTQ characters. Um, so just a couple of suggestions on that front. There are lots of resources out there, but um, these are a couple of LGBTQ inclusive books for middle school, middle schoolers. We have George by Alex Gino, Alan Cole is Not a Coward by Eric Bell, and The Misadventures of the Family Fletcher by Dana Allison Levy. Um, and these are some suggestions of LGBTQ inclusive books for high schoolers. Um, I've read a couple of these. Um, so Ruby Fruit Jungle is kind of a canonical lesbian coming of age story. I think it was written, written in the 70s and I'm in a queer book club in DC and we just read it and it was, it reminded me so much of Catcher in the Rye in a weird way because it was that kind of coming of age story but it was queer instead. Um, and I just sort of thought like, oh wow, this would have been amazing if we had read this in high school. Um, and similarly, James Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain has been around for a while and would have been wonderful to read in high school. Um, and then the other two books, The Vanishing Half and Patsy, are both books that um, came out in the last couple of years. And they, um, both of them tackle LGBTQ issues, but they also tackle themes of race and immigration. And so those are two suggestions uh, based on books that I've read recently that I think um, would be really good for, for the classroom, you know, on, because they're LGBTQ inclusive, but you know, they're also written by women of color and um, they were both really great books um, that I really liked this year. Um, a couple of other suggestions for um, bringing up LGBTQ history in your classroom. Um, Stonewall riots are sort of the most well-known um, riots related to the LGBT community is sort of the birth of the LGBTQ movement. But before that, there were actually riots at Compton's cafeteria in California. It was primarily transgender women who were rioting. And so both of those riots are things that could be talked about in LGBTQ history. Um, and as we mentioned before, there's a book on Stonewall that's in our collection this year by Rob Sanders. Um, there's also an increasing amount of openly LGBTQ politicians, which is very exciting. Um, so talking about those politicians like Harvey Milk, who was an openly gay um, mayor in San Francisco, Tammy Baldwin, who is an openly gay senator from Wisconsin, also a Smith College alum. Um, mayor Pete Buttigieg ran a great campaign for president. I never thought I would see an openly gay person run for president in my lifetime. And um, Rob Sanders has also written a book about Pete Buttigieg. Um, and then also talking about Sarah McBride, who is the first uh, transgender state senator. She was just elected in Delaware. Um, and so these are things that you can bring into the classroom as well. 
Um, and other pieces of history that we suggest you talk about are the marriage equality movement um, and also Don't Ask, Don't Tell and the transgender military ban. Um, but there's, there's really, there's so much out there. I took a couple of classes on LGBTQ history when I was in college and was just amazed by all of this information that I had really never had access to. Um, and just because I work um, at a public interest law firm, I'm uh, especially interested in law and there's lots of different cases that have come up before the Supreme Court um, dealing with LGBTQ issues, a couple of them here. Um, not all of these would be necessarily appropriate for the younger grades. Um, Lawrence v. Texas um, made same-sex intimacy legal, but you know, would not be good for the younger grades, but some of the others, um, United States versus Windsor and Obergefell versus Hodges are the two cases that went up before the Supreme Court about marriage equality, um, which are good for any age. And then just recently in June, we had Bostock versus Clayton County, um, which I was so excited that we won. I was not, not expecting that um, based on the court's makeup, but um, that made sure that um, LGBTQ uh, employment discrimination was illegal under uh, a federal statute called Title, Title VII. Um, also wanted to mention that there are ways to make math and science classes LGBTQ inclusive. It's, it takes a little bit more creative thinking sometimes, but um, certainly in the lower grades, teachers could include LGBTQ people and identities in word problems, you know, in any, in any way and in any grade. Um, thinking about the, the higher grades, um, using and collecting statistics about LGBTQ people by including several categories for gender and sexuality. Um, so that's you know, really interesting and, and gives you and your students the opportunity to sort of recognize that there are multiple genders and multiple sexualities and you should be um, accounting for that in your statistics as one would have you know, many categories of race. Um, Another suggestion, if you're teaching Algebra 2 and you're teaching linear programming, you could have students model the spread of the use of the they, them, their pronoun using linear programming. Um, and then moving on to science classes, it's really important to talk about and acknowledge LGBTQ um, people and intersex people in biology and acknowledging that there's different family structures and there's different reproductive structures and things like that. Um, we would also suggest avoid making generalized statements about sex and gender, such as only women menstruate or get pregnant, um, because there are transgender and non-binary people um, who will have those experiences, transgender men and non-binary people, um, and so it's good to not make those assumptions. Um, another thing, you could highlight variations in animal behavior, such as same-sex mating or animals who change their sex or have two sexes. Um, and always great to mention the achievements of LGBTQ scientists like Sally Ride, um, who was an astronaut, or Alan Turing. Um, final thing we're going to talk about is LGBTQ inclusive sex ed. And again, this would be um, designed primarily for high school students. Um, my high school um, sex ed classes were not LGBTQ inclusive. And so it's something that I wish that I had had access to when I was that age. Um, so making sure that the sex ed curriculum is LGBTQ inclusive is really important. Um, it's important to talk about ways to practice safe sex for all genders and all sexualities. Um, I think it's also really important not to limit the conversation uh, just to HIV and AIDS. That was sort of the experience in my high school where we only really talked about gay people and sex ed in the context of HIV AIDS and it felt um, very stigmatizing to me. And so while that's an important topic, it sort of can't be the only topic you talk about. Um, and then the last piece of this is to avoid heteronormative assumptions about how, uh, who students may have sex with. Again, just trying to avoid any kind of generalized assumptions is always a good practice. Yeah, so just wrapping it up at the end, um, talking about how teachers and students can continue to support Pride and Less Prejudice, um, and this could be for any age group. Um, we would love it if schools would do a fundraiser for us, maybe a loose change event, a loose change drive, or some other type of fundraiser to um, help us get funds for the books that we're donating. Um, to do service learning, at the beginning we were talking about the Luanda International School and we have partnered with them in Angola and we've been doing service learning for them and that's been really a wonderful um, partnership that we've created. Um, spread the word about PLP, let people know that we're there. If you have friends that 
live in the United States or in Canada and their teachers pre-K through third grade, get them on our waiting list, tell them to go to our website and ask for free books. Um, other things we could talk about is having the older kids, whether they're high schoolers or middle schoolers, do buddy reading programs and use these books or other books um, to have spark that conversation for a young age. And that's good for both the older kids and the younger kids. Um, if you're receiving books from us or you've received books from us and you have an experience that you wanna tell us about, we love getting testimonials from people. Um, that helps us. We put it on our website and our social media. We, we include it with um, some grant applications that we do. And if you're super thrilled and you're super excited about all the things you've heard about PLP and you want to volunteer for us, that's even better. We have a group of 11 individuals besides myself across the country um, doing all kinds of work for us, whether it be working on grant applications or helping us write our newsletter or um, doing our social media. There's all kinds of things we have volunteers helping us with and without them, we're nothing. So if you feel like you have an extra hour during the week and you wanna help us, that'd be awesome. Um, and yeah, and even just to get like some of the older kids, um, if there's already established GSAs um, or, you're an, or you're gonna establish a GSA, it's great to have those kids fundraise or buddy read um, for the younger kids. And so, so those are just a few extra things that we wanted to mention. Um, but yeah, get involved and follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and we're on Instagram and we're on Twitter. Um, we do have some upcoming events that we wanted to just say real quickly that um, last year we had some authors do some read alouds and we're really excited that in November 18th, which is only a few days away, we have a special guest, it's actually a drag queen, who's gonna be reading what does a princess really look like for National Princess Day. And it is gonna be up on our website and YouTube and all over our social media. And we're gonna leave it up for a few days. And we really hope that teachers will, you know, take that into the classroom or, you know, virtually show that to their classrooms and have a conversation. It's a great book. Um, and on December 7th, it's gonna be Jacob's Room to Choose. And that's gonna be Sarah and Ian Hoffman, the authors of that book are gonna read. Um, and we'll do the same. We'll have it up on Facebook and Instagram Live and we'll leave it up for a few days. The publishers are being really nice during COVID and letting us put things up and keep them up a little longer than they did last year, so that's great. Um, and I did mention at the very beginning that our next teacher workshop is January 26th. Um, it's author Rob Sanders telling our stories one book at a time, and it's an interview with the author. Uh, he's an author and a teacher, he's a fourth grade teacher, and he's written over a dozen books on the subject of LGBTQ um, community and it's real, he, he's got a really great collection. So if you don't know who he is, you should definitely check him out. Um, last slide is just a slide of a couple of resources that we find really helpful. HRC's Welcoming Schools has all kinds of really great articles, all kinds of lesson plans and book recommendations. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Mombian's website. She has a really comprehensive list of every book you have ever heard of for any age group. So I would go there first. She really covers it all in great detail. Um, Glisten is a great one that we talked about, the Trevor Project, GSA Network we talked about, and Advocates for Youth. These are all places that you can go. Um, at least it's a starting place. And I know I saw in the chat um, that other people were posting some places to check out resources as well, which is great. Um, so that is the end of our formal presentation, and we are here to answer any questions or have conversations with whoever is out there and wanting to talk. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. You know, one of the things I love is like being an educator means always being a learner. And, uh, you know, what I love about these webinar series is every time that I sit here and, and get to be educated more and more uh, on just everything around, you know, what are we doing to support kids in schools? Uh, and so really appreciate you guys taking time. We did have one question that was early on, uh, and I don't know, and maybe even Sheila in the chat, uh, we, can, uh, we can unmute you if you have something to add to this, but there was a question in the chat about what do you do with communities and parents uh, who maybe don't support uh, LGBTQ books in the library, in the school, or, or just this type of thing being going, what, is some, what are some things that you have helped or maybe you've seen or, or helped support parents and school communities at large to really accept 
yeah. accept these books and accept these ideas into our into our schools. Yeah. I mean, like I said before, we're not really experiencing a whole lot of that yet because mm -hmm. we're sending the books out to places who are wanting them. Who are with asking. That said, okay. Yeah, with that said, it's the teachers who are wanting them. And it's not necessarily always the parents who are wanting them. Mm -hmm. um, a short story that just happened to my sister. She lives in Massachusetts. She had, my nephew is transgender and he's grown and he's in college, he's, he's older. But the school that he went to as a kid, they just read um, when Aiden became his brother uh, to their classroom, the, the librarian read it out. And a parent was very, very, very upset and went out on Facebook and said, I would have wanted the heads up, this was not appropriate. I wasn't prepared to have this conversation at home and really made a big deal out of um, the whole situation. And I think for this particular situation, I think people really rallied around this librarian, which is awesome, and said, you know, we support what you're doing and we believe in you and the, the principal supported and, you know, so it was a good story. Um, I think that there are a lot of people out there that are going to be upset. They're not prepared. It, they're taken by surprise. <laughs> but you think about nobody ever comes home and says, oh my gosh, they read a story about a mother and a father. I, I can't believe that. So, so I, we need to normalize it. And I think we need to be brave. And I think we need to speak up. And I think we need to educate. I think we need to not just educate the kids, like I said before, but I think we need to educate the parents, the teachers, the administration, and the neighbors who are yelling, you know, on Facebook saying that this was a horrible thing to do. And, you know, Lisa, that's why I think it's so important that you actually have those teacher guides, you know, kind of as companion pieces, because I think that transparency of what we're talking about when we're talking about LGBTQ plus inclusive books, that's a part of it, because I think... If you have never read a book with two moms, you make assumptions about maybe what the messaging is. And uh, I'm actually, I'm gonna give a little shout out to my wife who did a great job of documenting her process of teaching inclusive books with first graders. So I've just dropped the link to that. Um, and, and she kind of walks through the student work and I think demystifying what those conversations are about. And when teachers and parents and caretakers realize we're talking about the stuff we always talked about. We're talking about family. Right. We're talking about friendship, about acceptance, identity. I think whew, there's a little bit of stress that comes off because, you know, you pointed to this earlier that sometimes there's an assumption um, that LGBTQ plus books, children's books are about sex, which yeah. they are not. And I, I do think there's that demystifying process there. But, you know, Jeff, to your point, you know, I'm entering into nearly my second decade with education and there is always that pushback, right? Often, and it might just be one parent out of the 50 that you teach, but there has always been at least one. Uh, and something that is, or two things that have worked for me as an educator is know your school's mission or values, because often there's some sort of language in there around like everybody is welcome or, you know, we're teaching people to be tolerant, blah, blah, blah. So you can point them back to that. But I think then there is the piece, and there was a little chat, uh, side chat happening during this, that this is the way that the workplace is going too. So, you know, these conversations are not necessarily just for the queer kids at school, but for all of the kids who are going to need to be capable of working with just about anybody. So that piece sometimes yeah, has so resonated. Um, you know, I, I think of these people as hesitant allies. It's, it's the same with technology's place in school, right? Like if, if parents and caretakers didn't have that in their educational experience, there's fear in what we don't know. And I often think, you know, folks come on board when they're like, oh, but you know, my child is probably gonna have to use these tools in their future job. And there, there is this cultural competency that they are also going to need to have in future careers. So sometimes that resonates with people um, who, are, who are fearful. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the unknown. And you know, if we can just keep educating how simple these stories are and how non-threatening these stories are, it'll go a long way. Awesome. Well, thank you. If there's any more uh, questions over in the chat, you can please put those over there. Uh, we can continue to talk here for a few more minutes. I uh, appreciate you guys again taking time. I know it's late uh, back there on the East Coast. So it's always good when we can do this cross cross country and to have uh, Sheila here from Angolia. 
uh, is fantastic as well to have her in the chat uh, talking about her experiences as well. So um, appreciate all you are doing and, and ways that you are helping to support. We, a couple of things here I threw in the chat. Uh, our mayor here in the city of Seattle, Seattle is, is openly gay. And so that it's been fantastic. She was elected a couple of years ago um, and just won the second term, I think maybe a little while ago. Uh, which which was uh, quite nice, and we did. I mean, I was looking. One of the things we just passed uh, here in the state of Washington, we we passed uh, the one of the things on this last ballot was called Referendum 90, which was teaching sex ed from kindergarten. Get we have to teach sex ed kindergarten through twelfth grade now. And I was just wondering if they were able to slip anything in there around teaching LGBTQ plus as well. And I didn't see anything. Um, I saw that a couple of people on the list of um, doctors and you know uh, leaders that were put that around that referendum uh, came from LGBTQ plus uh, communities in support of, but I didn't see any language that actually made it in there. And I was hoping that there would be something because the, the referendum is really about this idea of uh, being safe and inclusiveness. That's really what it was. And I was hoping that there was something else wrapped around in it, but uh, I don't think it actually, the actual wording, you know, it's something like you were saying, those other states that were able to hold their, uh, to have actually have something in, in state law to say that we should be teaching this or we need to be teaching this, right. I think is uh, is there. But uh, knowing the state of Washington, I have a feeling we'll get there pretty fast. We're, we're pretty progressive out here. So hopefully we get there. I will say I still, I, what I love about, you know, the idea that you're making it so easy for folks to request these books is that, you know, Jeff, I've seen, you know, even in places where like, this is part of the law, this is part of what we say school is in this location. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, there's lots of excuses that, that people can find to avoid doing it. And what I, you know, sometimes it's, it's budgeting. Well, we can't, we can't yeah, order right. new books. And I feel like, you know, this is just such a perfect answer to that to, okay, well, maybe we don't have to buy them. Yeah. Um, so, right. you know, again, that, that's such a great for schools that are saying, okay, I know that we're supposed to be doing this, but we can't afford it. And, right. you know, schools are, budgets are tight right now. I get yeah. that. So. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I think I believe about half of our school requests are coming from Title One schools. At mm. this point, it might be even more than half of our requests. I think we're um, closer to fifty-five percent or sixty percent of the requesting schools are actually. Yeah. Title. And yeah. so we're really thrilled that that's the case and that we're able to support those schools. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, and you know, I actually have even gotten um, requests from from teachers who are doing daycare. And they're saying the babies and the toddlers, and we need them too. <laughs> you know, we get the older grades asking for them. We get the younger grades asking, which is awesome that, that there are people of all ages asking to have the books. But it's really true. Like there's great board books out there. There's no reason why we shouldn't be trying to do that as well. Yeah, when yeah. my cousin was little, he's nine now, but this was a few years ago, I bought him um, A is for activist, And I think like, you know, L was for LGBTQ or T was for transgender. I'm not sure if his parents ever read it to him because they're not as liberal as we are, but I was really trying. <laughs> That's great. Well, you know, and again, I, I kind of think we label these as children's books, but, you know, you, you pointed out the idea of doing buddy classes or, you know, again, even just recommending parents and caretakers check these out, because I, I do think that idea of if you, if you are not familiar with media, you've never watched a movie or a TV show where you have a, a queer protagonist, sometimes those children books where you realize this is exactly like the books that I grew up with just slightly different, you know, but often the narrative is the same. So, you know, we, we had a question about, you know, what, how do you react to folks that are really upset or they feel fearful around this change? Sometimes I think they're not actually fearful of the change. They're fearful of the unknown element of the change. Yes, um, and so I think even just that invitation to check out the book is, is really great. And, you know, something that my, my wife and I have found with parents and even just fellow colleagues, what I find, especially if you are an educator, you're so fearful of getting it wrong, of saying the wrong thing. And I find that's been the same with some, uh, you know, some parents and guardians in the community too, is they don't necessarily want to say the wrong thing. And just even reminding folks, we're all on a learning journey. Like it's going to be okay to say the wrong thing. Let's figure out what a better thing might be to say together and I kind of just think that's across the board with education right like students that are fearful of getting it wrong in math what if again we're all on the learning journey here we're, we're going to make a few mistakes if we're truly trying to do a little bit of a better job regardless of what the topic is 
for sure. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. Support everybody in being better, right? Wherever you are in the journey. So awesome. Well, thank you so much again uh, for your time, uh, your energy, uh, and, and for all you are doing. Um, we'll make sure that, you know, this gets posted everywhere and, and hopefully uh, continue to support any way that we can here. And of course, got a great ally in, Tr in Trisha here uh, with her podcast as well and everything that she's doing. So that's fantastic yes, uh, as well. So um, we really appreciate the opportunity and the support. It's been great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. This was wonderful. Yeah. Well, awesome. we just look forward to seeing, you know, it's only just been your first year for your nonprofit. And hey, you already it's had incredible a connection with Adam Rippon, like he's just such an amazing ice skater, like which Olympian are you going to connect with for year two? Fingers crossed we eventually get Megan Rapino. That's <sighs> on my top list for everything. But you know, she's, she's a little busy. Her, uh, her memoir comes out tomorrow. I'm really excited about it. That's and, and Tricia is really jealous because we have tried to reach out to celebrities uh, here at Shifting Schools a couple of times. <laughs> and she's just always like, how do they do it? How do they get people? <laughs> Let's chat offline. I got some tips for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I really think that this was when COVID helped us because I yeah, think right. we were home. I think the celebrities were home. Some celebrities were super interested, but they were so busy they couldn't. And sure. then there were celebrities who were just looking for stuff to do and good stuff to do. And yeah, so right. We lucked out in that way. Yeah. Um, you know, they taped themselves. So right. they, yeah. you know, they were all doing it on their phones at home. They weren't having their PR people do it. Um, but they yeah. did. They helped us. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. I yeah. want those. I want those offline tips. Definitely send those our way. Yeah, I like, for sure. I like embarrassed myself with how many times I tried to contact Dave Matthews because he's a Washington native. So I oh, thought he'd want to support us. Dave Matthews, if you can hear this now, it's not <laughs> <laughs> she's not giving up. That's uh, you gotta let you, she that. will not give up. <laughs> she's got a goal. <laughs> not give up and anything is worth a try because we never thought we'd get the response we did so we said hey let's throw it all at the wall and see if anything sticks and you know just don't be afraid to go for it and try yeah thank for you. sure for yeah. sure awesome. all right thank you guys appreciate it thank you so much yeah, great to see you both be well thank you so much thank stay you. safe take thank care you. thank you bye, bye, -bye.